oops, I forgot to update the the title of the stream. Uh, all right, so how are we all doing this afternoon? Hopefully pretty good. Um, it was uh, snowing uh, earlier today here in Crawfordsville. Uh, not much, but it was in fact snowing, um, which is somewhat crazy given that it's April, mid-April at that, but uh, c'est la vie. Um, okay, so let me minimize Discord here and uh, load um, our... Um, our program stuff. Uh, so what um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to start talking about looping structures. So uh, last time we talked about the jump command, uh, which was in our sample program, this line here. Uh, and the way the jump command works is it uh, changes the value of the program counter. So the program counter, remember, points to uh, the next location in memory where you would load the next instruction. And um, if uh, so, if you change the value of the program counter, then the val where the next instruction you're going to load from also changes to be that new location. Um, so this is the only way that the program counter can be changed other than um, it normally incrementing by 2. Um, so in our particular sample program here uh, that we were writing last time to detect whether or not a number was positive or negative, um, we jumped forward to uh, memory cell 1,0 if the condition was, uh, was true. And uh, so we were jumping forward in memory, and 1,0 uh, was the address of the, the instruction to go to if we jumped, which was uh, this instruction down here. Um, but it is not required that the jump go forward in memory. In fact, the jump can also go backwards in memory. Um, and so this is how, uh, by using a jump or perhaps several jumps, we can uh, construct a looping, uh, looping type structure. Uh, OK, so let's, uh, let's make a new program. And let me save it real quick so we've got that. Um, And uh, we're going to make a looping structure uh, this time. And uh, we, have to, we need to come up with an example of what to do that's a loop. And uh, one thing that we could do is something that we actually discussed. Uh, uh, this came up in the, in the chat, I think, a couple of times ago, which was uh, multiplication. So a really, a, a relatively inefficient way to do multiplication would be to just think of it as repeated addition. So um, so what we'll do is, let's say we will load um, All right, so let's say that we're going to load in two numbers, um, one from E0 and one from E1. And then we're going to add the number E0 to itself a number of times equal to whatever came into the, uh, to the other uh, register. Um, OK, so uh, like before, um, I'll wait on putting the memory addresses uh, in the left because 
um, uh, as we're writing the program, we may realize we need to add something, and that will, of course, change all of the memory addresses. Uh, so we'll leave that out for the moment, uh, but we'll put them in when we're done at the end. All right, so the first command we need, of course, is to load. Uh, let's put the first number into register uh, 1. Uh, and the second number into register 2. They've got to go somewhere. Um, and then um, we need to um, uh, we need to load a couple of other things uh, in. I need to load in to a register the number 0. And I need to load into another register the number 1. Okay, now why the, we'll need those will become clear in a moment. Um, so uh, the reason, like even though all the registers start out by default having the number 0 in them, if you clear the CPU, um, manually loading the number 0 into a register is basically a cover your butt kind of technique. Um, if we were writing a much larger program, it might be the case that something else was already in that register and we're needing to use it for a new purpose, so we needed to uh, clear it. Why we need the number one is, well, if we're going to multiply by repeated addition, then we need a way to count up each time we do something, okay? So uh, if I start a counter at zero, um, and in fact, um, uh, I'll use register 3 here as my counter, then each time I do something, I'm going to add uh, 3, or sorry, add 1 to the value of the counter, and uh, so I need the counter to start off at 0 because I haven't done anything, and uh, 01 is how much I'm going to increase my counter by each time. Okay, so I'm going to think of this register is my counter how much I add to the counter then this was first number and this was second number okay and then let's see what else do we need here uh, we need um, um, as we're going to see in a moment we actually can put the second number into register 0. But actually, what I'm going to do, because we haven't used this yet, is um, um, oops, sorry, I need, I meant to have a 0 here and a uh, sorry, two zero is what I want. Um, so we haven't used that instruction before, so this gives us an excuse to use it. Uh, I'm going to copy uh, the second number and put it in register zero also, in addition to register one, or uh, sorry, register two. Now I could have just put it only in register zero. That probably would have been more efficient. Um, and uh, but I'll go ahead and leave it like this because I think that'll illustrate uh, something good uh, later when we get into the actual meat of it. All right, so uh, these first five instructions are just going to load in uh, values that we need uh, in order to do something into some of the registers. So our first our two numbers. Um, and uh, the bit pattern of all zeros and the bit pattern uh, for the number one, uh, which was, is what we'll add to the counter each time. Um, uh, yeah, so the, yes, Filippo, the, uh, the move instruction here um, is a, uh, is copies the data from one register to another, um, which is one reason why uh, the, the, the mnemonic for this is is move, which makes you think that it destroys the source thing. So copy is really a better word for it, but um, the the book calls it move, and so I just stuck with that language so as to not 
uh, introduce confusion. Uh, well, any more confusion than necessary. So yeah, move just takes data from one to another. Um, so actually, um, no, it is copying the other direction. It's copying from two to zero, which I realize is backwards from um, the, uh, the syntax that we've usually used, uh, which is kind of annoying. So like, let me, let me go to uh, this and clear it and uh, show you that. Okay, so let me first just load a number um, into register one. Um, I'm just going to load five five. Or uh, let's see which load do I want. Um, nope, sorry, I wanted opcode two. Uh, so let me just load in a number to uh, a register. And then let me copy it um, and so the syntax is here from register R to register S so if I do 3012 then this should copy it oops uh, so if I run the first instruction I load the first register with the number five five okay whatever and then the second instruction is going to um, oops sorry I used the wrong thing four is the opcode um, sorry um, sorry I hit the wrong button okay this should have been four zero one two not three okay so um, Okay, so 2155, load that register, and then the second instruction is move register 1 to register 2. So yes, the order is backwards from what, uh, what it perhaps ought to be. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's the fault of the book. Okay, so um, now one other thing to point out there is that notice that the, uh, there's a zero here. And that's because uh, to move from one register to another, um, you only need to specify two things, the source register and the destination register. But since on this machine, all instructions have to take up two bytes, we've got four bits that we don't actually need. And so uh, the, the standard on this particular machine is to hard code that to a zero. So all of the move instructions are going to be four zero and then something something um, that's just the the, the standard uh, for this system and so notice that there's that zero right there that is hard coded um, to to this instruction uh, there are two other instructions that have hard coded zeros the rotate instruction which we'll talk about more later and then of course the halt command uh, is C followed by all zeros. So, uh, so yeah, no, I know, Filippo, you're uh, you're right that uh, uh, this instruction, the move instruction, has stuff sort of backwards from what you would think. Um, and I suppose if I ever define the version 2.0 of this language, that's one thing I'll fix is to uh, to make it go the other way. But um, anyway, it is what it is. Okay, so. Um, all right, any other questions on the uh, loading in stuff um, in our sample program? So hopefully that's uh, Gucci. Um, okay, so now that we've loaded in the, the two numbers, we actually need to do something. Um, so the reason that I copied um, register uh, 2 to register 0, the second number, is because what I want to do is I want to check, um, have I reached the value of the counter? Okay, so let me write down below what we're actually doing in more Python-like syntax. All right, so... In Python, we would maybe write this. Um, let me just pick some example numbers. Okay. 
okay? Something like this. So let's say that our first num was 5 and our second number was 3. Um, then what I would be doing is saying while uh, counter is not equal to second num, uh, I also need to make a um, total equals zero, um, which means, actually, I forgot to, to make another register here. Um, while this equals, while, okay, so hold on. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Not equals here. Okay, so in Python, uh, not equals is denoted um, with a exclamation mark. Uh, I could also say it this way, which is maybe a little bit um, maybe a little bit easier to read. Okay, so while the the counter and the second number are not the same, that means that my counter has not yet hit the second number. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say total equals um, first num plus, or sorry, total equals total plus first num, counter equals counter plus one. Okay, and so, um, and then I would return the value of the counter, or not the counter, but the total. Okay, so this would be what we're writing in Python. We have a counter starting at zero. We have our two numbers that get loaded in. We have a total, and we start with the, ca the, the counter at zero. We, the total starts at zero. We add the first number to it. We add one to the counter, and then we come up and say, hey, is the counter equal to um, is the counter equal to the second number? Yes or no. If it's not equal, then that means we're not finished, so keep going through the loop. Otherwise, we're done, and we can jump in and go to the return. Okay. So this is what the code would look like in Python, and now what we're essentially doing is we need to turn this into assembly. The first little chunk, uh, and I just realized that uh, I forgot to uh, make a register for the total. So let's uh, let's put the total in register five, and it starts at zero because we haven't added anything. Okay, and um, okay, so that gets all of our numbers stored. Uh, the first four instructions, or six here, which I've been a little bit inefficient, um, gets um, uh, gets everything loaded in, and now we're ready to basically write the looping part of the structure. Okay, so uh, what we need to do is um, the first part, whenever you have a while condition, okay, that should be Q for a jump, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write jump twice, and we'll see why I need it twice here in a second, okay? And I'll worry about what the, the details are for the jump in just a minute. Um, so then what is the loop body? What is it that I do um, each time that I'm inside my while loop? I need to add the first number to the total, okay? So that would be add the first number, Nomia, sorry, the dog is, wants attention and she's going to get locked out of the office because I have to teach. She's very displeased with not getting constant attention while I'm teaching. Uh, okay, so let's see, back to where were we? So we need to add um, the total which is stored in register 5, 
along with the first number, which is stored in register 1, and we're going to put the answer into register 5. Okay, now that overwrites the value of the total. Okay, so it takes the old value of register 5, the value of register 1, and then adds those together, and then the new value, it sticks that answer back into register 5. Okay, so this may look like it's bad, but it's actually okay. We, okay, then also we need to add our counter. Um, we need to add one to our counter. Okay, um, and uh, that's it. Okay, so the loop body in this particular example was just two instructions, right? Add the first number to the total and add one to our counter. And each of those instructions are a single, uh, can be accomplished with a single assembly instruction. Okay, now the two jumps, this is where it gets fun. So, how do we know that we're finished doing things? We know that we're finished if the uh, value of the counter is equal to the value of the second number. Okay, the second number we copied into register 0, and the counter is sitting into register 3. So what I need to do is I need to compare register 3 to register 0, and if they're the same, then I need to jump. Okay. Okay, um, no, Mia, hang on one second, guys. She's very displeased with me. Okay, so, um, jump to the end, and we'll write what the end is here in a minute, okay? And then here's what makes this loop actually a loop is I need to at the very or after I finish the loop body I need to go back up and test whether or not I'm finished looping. Okay so um, here is kind of a fun question. Alright so the jump command compares a register, whichever register you specify, to register zero. Okay, and if the two things are equal, then it jumps. Otherwise, it doesn't. So, how can I make a jump automatically happen no matter what? Okay, so the question for the peanut gallery. How can I make a jump automatically take place no matter what? Okay, and keep in mind, you're always comparing something to register zero, and you're jumping when the thing you're comparing to register zero is equal to register zero. So how can I make a jump happen 100% of the time? Any comments from the peanut gallery? All right, Teague with the, uh, the th op 360 no scope. Uh, yes, you use register 0 as R. So what we do is we compare register 0 to itself. Okay, and no matter what is sitting in register 0, it is equal to itself. And so this is how you get an unconditional jump that 100% of the time will happen. Okay, now, I don't know where that jump will take me. I know it needs to go back up to the top of the loop. But I don't know what memory address that is yet, so I'll just call back. Um, I'll just call the memory address M N for now. Okay. When the loop is finished, then all I need to do is I need to store uh, my total was sitting in register five, and I chose to store that in memory cell E two and then I need to halt. Okay, so that is literally it uh, once the loop is complete is just to store the answer and quit.
Okay. Now that I have, uh, but we haven't loaded anything into register zero. Actually, yes, we have. We put that here. Um, but, uh, Mike, for the purposes of this instruction, it doesn't matter what's in register zero. There's something there, whatever it is. Uh, it can literally be any of 256 bit patterns, but I guarantee you it's equal to whatever it is itself is. Okay, so that's sort of stupid, right? But that's like saying like uh, something like, isn't it true that three equals three always? So this would be kind of like saying if X equals X, then blah, blah, blah. Well, X always equals X, no matter what X's value is. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is sort of the brilliant thing that the jump, this jump command, when it is executed, 100% of the time, the jump will actually take place. Okay, so now that we've got all that, let's get on our memory addresses. And just like before, I'm going up by twos each time. Okay, now that we have all of the memory addresses there, we know we can figure out what MN and XY are. So XY means to need to jump to the end, and the end is this bit. So that needs to be 1, 4, okay? And then this needs to be 0, C, to jump back, to go from this line back up to that line. Okay, uh, where's, oh, oh, you're right, Mike, I can't count. Let's try this again, sorry. Um, okay, so that means that this is 1, 2, and that's 0, A. So, yes, um, counting is hard if, uh, if you haven't figured that out yet. All right, so now that we have that, um, I'm going to put, um, let's put, the instructions uh, to the left this time rather than to the right, uh, let's actually write these things in machine code. Okay, so this one is 1, 2, E1. This one is 4, 0, uh, 2, 0. Oops, that was not what I wanted. Okay, so 4020 was the instruction, 40 moves from register 2 to register 0, okay, um, and then uh, load, this would be 2300, zero, zero. this would be 2401, oh, and this would be 2500, zero, zero. okay. Uh, then my jump command was B312. My additions 5551. Five, uh, my this one's 5334. Three, three, and then B00A is my unconditional jump. Then my store was 35E2. And then my halt, of course, is C000. Okay, so uh, basically you guys noticed that all of the, uh, the instructions, uh, I got them off of that list, the list over here on the left, but I've been writing in this particular assembly, assembly language long enough that I've basically memorized most of them. And uh, so there we go. Uh, okay, so now all I need to do is I need to just take all of these and put them into a, a, a string. And hopefully not 
make any typos. Okay, so there is our uh, string of instructions just all strung together. All right, so now let's uh, let's go over to our emulator and let's put this in. And remember, after you paste in the uh, code to the URL, you have to, have to hit refresh. All right, I need two numbers in um, memory and uh, just for sake of example, I chose five and three. Uh, so this would do five times three. What answer should we get? So what's 05 times 03? So type it in the chat, the um, Twitch chat, see if we play. So 05 times 03, what answer should we be expecting to get here? All right, yes, 15 and base 10, but how is that going to look once uh, on this little machine? It will be what? Oh, it's going to be in hex, of course. So the answer that we should be looking for here is 0F uh, for 15 and hex. Okay, so, uh, so we should see 0F pop out when all is said and done here. Okay, so let's step through this. Uh, so the first thing that happens is um, oh crap guys I just realized I forgot an instruction. Um, all right so let me let me clear this. So um, it looks like I accidentally deleted um, loading in the first number. Uh, I don't know how I managed to do that. So I must have accidentally overwritten that line. Okay, so what this means is I need to add an instruction here, and then all of my memory addresses are off by one or two, rather. Okay, and then that means that I need to add the instruction in here, 11E0, and then I also need to change, this is now 14, and that is now 0C, so I need to go through and change that there and there. Okay, so let me fix that. Okay, so that should do it. All right, so let's try this again. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Teague, you're right. Even I subconsciously must have been thinking that. So, all right, so load in the first number. Oh, sorry, I um, I forgot to, to put the memory stuff back in. So let's do it. We did, oh, oops, wrong cell. Um, we did 05 and 03. All right, so... Load in the first number, load in the second number, copy the second number to the register zero, load register three with zeros, load register four with one, load register five with zero. Okay, now, is register uh, zero equal to register three? No, they are not. So the jump will not take place, and we will add. So our total becomes five. Our counter becomes 1, and then we continue. Okay, and now, um, register 0 is 3, that was the second number, and our counter has now added up to 3, those are equal so this jump will take place. Program counter gets reset to 1, 4. And then that loads in our store instruction. And it goes out to memory, and we get 0F. OK. Um, so 
uh, let's uh, let's pick a different set of numbers here uh, to make sure that it's uh, that this works. Actually, one thing I could do is uh, what about if I reorder the numbers? So what about if I did it this way? So what's the difference between multiplying three by five and five by three? And there's two answers to this question. All right, so what's, uh, yeah. So mathematically, there's no difference between three times five and five times three, but three times five will take five repetitions whereas five times three only takes three repetitions. So the way we're thinking of this is three times five is three plus three plus three plus three plus three, and five times three is five plus five plus five. Okay, so this actually reminds me of um, uh, every now and then you see memes going around on Facebook of uh, uh, basically kids' arithmetic homework or math homework getting marked wrong even though it looks right um, and there's one that's basically just like this I'll see if I can find the picture because it's kind of uh, kind of hilarious um, anyway all right so we should get the same answer so let me clear out the answer uh, memory cell just so that we'll notice what what gets written there um, so the exact same answer should appear but it's gonna go through the loop okay which was this stuff there it's going to go through the loop five times instead of three because it's only adding three each time uh, to the number. Okay, so, all right, so I'm going to clear and run. And, uh, again, the first little chunk of stuff is just going to load in all the numbers into the registers that we need to work with. Um, uh, clear out our total and our counter values and then get to it. Okay, so watch the registers here. Register... 5 is going to count up by 3s because we're adding 3 each time. Register 3 is going to count up by 1 each time because it's just counting how many times have we done something. And and there we go. We still get the same answer. Uh, okay, so it took slightly longer to execute, but it worked. Okay, so um, the um, what we've done is we've basically written a while loop, um, which, uh, as as we discussed before, you can think of a, while, a for loop as a special instance of a while loop where you have a counter, and that's exactly what we did. We made a counter variable, and uh, we added one to it each time, uh, and then we had a total that we were sort of uh, a running total, uh, and we knew we were finished whenever the counter hit the second number, uh, which was the number of times that the thing needed to happen. Okay, So if we were doing some other thing where, let's say, we needed to repeat a specific procedure 12 times, whatever, then we would load in, um, we would need a counter uh, variable or a counter register, and we would also need uh, the total number of repetitions, however many it was supposed to be, uh, to be stored somewhere so that we could compare our counter to that number. Okay, and, um, right, okay. So uh, let me get rid of these spaces here. Um, and, uh, right, so, uh, hopefully what this will kind of, you know, guys will start to get a sense for is how we're translating, uh, something that's sort of written in Python, uh, into a, um, uh, into assembly. All right, so T gas, can you multiply negative numbers? Um, the answer is Partly yes with this particular method. So, if the first number is negative, okay, that's the number that we add to itself uh, over and over again. If the first number is negative, this will work fine, okay? And it'll work fine because all we would do is add a number to itself a particular number of times. So, let's say, for example, we did negative 3 times 5. 
well then I would have negative 3 plus negative 3 plus negative 3 and so on five times and that would give me negative 15. Uh, the way that we've written this program currently however would not work if the second number was negative okay and the reason is that if the second number is negative then we would be adding to a counter starting at zero and waiting until the counter reached that negative number okay which will happen eventually but it will have to go all the way up through 127 wrap back around to minus 128 and then keep counting up from minus 128 until it hits whatever the second number is um, so it wouldn't be infinite uh, it would be a um, uh, it would be a finite loop in this case uh, but it would give us complete garbage for our answer okay um, so the uh, the moral of the story is if you have to deal with uh, multiplying negatives this is not the way to do it okay um, this is sort of a naive approach um, and um, you could code things in so for example you could say all right check to see if the second number is negative if it is replace it with its absolute value do the multiplication that way and then throw a minus sign in front of the answer at the end uh, you could do that um, but maybe the better way to say this is that this is um, this is not the way to do multiplication in practice um, I chose this as a, an example for a looping structure um, but you would not want to actually do multiplication this way uh, there are much more sophisticated algorithms that are far better for um, uh, that um, so this method is best for unsigned integers no I wouldn't say it's best because it's inefficient um, the um, particularly let's say that we had something like uh, um, you know we were multiplying something by 38 well uh, then this this method would require us to add something to itself 38 times okay which is rather inefficient to go through 38 instances of a loop um, so uh, this is one of those situations where uh, to borrow from uh, Looney Tunes it's better to go back to the old drawing board and come up with a better algorithm from the get-go that uh, is not only more efficient but also will work for both positive and uh, negative numbers um, and uh, uh, there's a couple of different methods for this that are particularly useful uh, the so-called Russian peasant method uh, is really really a good uh, good method of doing binary multiplication um, there's also a method called the quarter square method uh, which looks really funny when you first see it but it actually works great um, and um, yeah it is worth noting by the way that um, so let me go back to the bastion of all knowledge of Western civilization, uh, namely Wikipedia. All right, so this little guy here, this was the very first computer that I ever used in my life. Okay, it was released in August of 1982 for $595. Uh, now. For the reference, I was born in November of 1982, so this thing uh, is slightly older than I am. Um, and my dad bought one of these things in uh, either 1983 or 84. I'm not entirely sure when, um, but he, um, they bought that. Uh, yeah, not only is that a lot of money back then, right, $1,500 um, in, you know, 2019. Uh, dollars but um, you know my dad at the time was a um, you know second lieutenant uh, or sorry he would have been a first lieutenant at that point in the Marine Corps uh, so he was uh, a low-ranking officer and not necessarily making a ton of money um, but he and my mom uh, mom he managed to bribe my mother into buying one of these things 
and so uh, so they got one, and uh, it was really rocking uh, in terms of its technology. 64K of RAM, uh, one megahertz processor, uh, and uh, the graphics, oh man, the graphics were amazing. 320 by 200 in 16 colors. You better bet it was really awesome. Okay, but the reason I bring this machine up is because, let me see if we've got some more pictures of it. Um, it had cartridges, so you could also load disks into it. Um, here we go. This is basically what it would have looked like. Uh, you had a floppy drive attachment that went with it. You would have to have a monitor, which I'm sure cost extra. Um, and uh, basically the monitor was just a glorified little television. Um, but in particular, this machine did not have hardware multiplication. Okay, so if you wanted to do multiplication on this thing, um, you basically had to program in a multiplication algorithm, kind of like what we just did. Um, and uh, it was possible to program this in BASIC, uh, which is, uh, how many of you guys programmed anything in TI uh, like, uh, did you have the Texas Instruments calculators when you were in middle school and high school, like a TI-84 or something? How many of you guys programmed stuff on your TI calculators uh, when you were in school? Or, maybe better put, got games that somebody else had written, like the little snake game or stupid stuff like that? Um, so, oh, the TI-84 actually came with games? Oh man, you kids these days! You had it, you had it luxuriously, man. Uh, when I, back in my day, with my TI-82, uh, it didn't come with any games, so you had to program them yourself uh, or get somebody else to program them. Um, so anyway, that language is called BASIC, and it's um, a basic. Well, it's a basic programming language, pun intended. Um, but um, yeah, they weren't too happy when they found out about the games, yeah. See, our teachers were cool with it because you had to program them in yourself, and they figured that was learning, so, okay, whatever. Um, yeah, uh, but, so BASIC, uh, it came with a BASIC interpreter, which allowed you to write um, uh, simple programs that would get translated into assembly by the machine. It was also possible to program directly in assembly, um, but you had to know what you were doing because this used the 6510, which was the uh, modified form of the 6502, and um, which we've talked about, okay? And the assembly instructions for this processor, uh, you guys think that so our assembly has uh, 12 instructions. The assembly for the 6502 had on the order of 100 or so uh, instructions, and it was a lot more complicated. Uh, it also had way fewer registers, which was kind of annoying. Um, that, uh, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, let's kind of wrap up for the day. Uh, so I'll save this to Canvas. Um, and if you haven't already noticed uh, on Canvas, so let me go to our class. I've added down in here, oops, it would help to go to the correct class I wanted this semester. Uh, down here at the bottom, I've got assembly resources. So um, the uh, first link goes to a copy of the notes, which is this document here that has the opcode table in it um, and if I add anything to the notes that link will always point to the most recent version because it's pointing to my file on Dropbox. Uh, I've got a link to the emulator website and then I've got two of the examples we've written so far um, and I'll add the other ones to it. Um, uh, the, like for example we just wrote this uh, this looping one so I need to add the uh, 
uh, assembly one dot Brookshire, assembly two dot Brookshire, conditionals and loops. Conditionals, what we did last time. Loops, this is the example that we worked through today. Uh, there are more examples of all of those inside this document here, uh, the notes. So I've been kind of deliberate here to not, if possible, um, to not necessarily do exactly the same um, uh, the exactly the same uh, uh, examples in the notes uh, so that you guys have more examples to uh, to look at. So a really fun example uh, would be uh, to, to take a look uh, before uh, maybe we talk last time or next time about the uh, this program here which computes the Fibonacci sequence up through a particular number of them. Uh, so the Fibonacci sequence is the famous 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. Um, it comes up in art and stuff a lot. Uh, actually, Fibonacci came up with this thinking about uh, rabbits mating, um, sort of the population growth. Um, so maybe look through that uh, example and uh, kind of see how it, uh, how it works. And then I'm working on adding some stuff here towards the end which is to basically have sort of broad strokes example structures in Python uh, like syntax and then kind of what roughly speaking uh, the structure would be of, a, of an assembly equivalent to that. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and quit, uh, quit for today um, and uh, I'll be posting some stuff, uh, to more stuff to Canvas here shortly. Uh, remember that uh, just by way of reminder, you guys have um, uh, the video game project is due Sunday, um, and uh, there is a short assignment, homework assignment, over the machine code uh, due tomorrow night that's basically to translate instructions from English into their proper opcodes, um, and uh, so please, please make sure you get that uh, done. Uh, that will be... Uh, Making sure you're solid with those, with that particular assignment will help for uh, the machine code project, which I'll be uploading the details of uh, here in the not too distant future. Uh, and the machine code project will do in sort of various, um, uh, will write sort of several programs and then eventually you'll kind of amalgamate them together. Um, yeah, so the opcode sheet is inside the notes. Uh, this Brookshire assembly and machine notes, and that is uh, this very first item in the assembly resources is a copy of the notes. The cheat sheet is one of the pages within that. Um, I didn't make it a separate file. I just put it all in the same same place. So uh, it's also in the book. Um, it's in Appendix C of the textbook. Um, is the the opcode table. And uh, then chapter two of the textbook has uh, more discussion of this. Um, my notes are um, starting to get to the point where I think they're more expansive than chapter two, but um, yeah, anyway. All right, so we'll go ahead and quit for the day, and I will see you guys on Discord if you have any questions, and uh, I'll see you guys on Friday.